was the life. They had arrived. Business was booming. There were deals to be had. Everybody who was anybody was there. There was the new rich, the old rich, and of course the stars were there. A lot of new somebodies were there. They were dancing their nights away as if there were no tomorrows. At least, none worth worrying about. But there was one tomorrow fated to come, which would change everyone's destiny. Early Tuesday morning, October 29th, 1929, the stock market opened, just as it had for the last 20 years. The trading floor was a frenzy of activity, except on this day, all the trade orders were to sell, not buy. But not even the experts suspected the devastating crash that would become known as the Great Depression. Not only did it dramatically change the lives of all Americans, but it affected the lives of millions more around the world. Once prominent traders and wealthy businessmen jumped to their deaths from multi-story buildings, hard-working people lost their life savings, businesses, homes, and jobs. Thousands of millionaires became mere statistics in the fast-growing ranks of the unemployed. The middle class virtually disappeared. By the end of the year, the market lost the unbelievable sum of $40 billion in equity. Three years later, at the depth of the Depression, the national income fell by 50%. 5,000 banks closed their doors. The degree of universal pain and suffering prompted President Franklin Roosevelt to take action which would once have been considered illegal. The Founding Fathers had been firm on the fact that the government was never to interfere with the free enterprise system. But Roosevelt boldly initiated his New Deal. And for the first time in U.S. history, the government provided help, called entitlements for the needy. The stage was set for the federal government to dominate American business, banking, commerce, and the economy as a whole. It was the promise of acquiring prosperity built on borrowing without the ability to repay, which had tempted normally conservative Americans to risk all they own before the crash. In 1928, there was no venture too risky to invest in. There had been a few prophetic voices that warned of impending financial disaster because of the accumulated debt, yet their words were dismissed as just so much gloom and doom. This was America. This was the strongest nation on earth. Ironically, the cure for the Depression was built on another kind of debt, much broader in scope, government debt. Little did President Roosevelt and subsequent politicians who followed suit know it would incur such crippling and long-range consequences, consequences which would be more devastating to the nation than the Great Depression itself. Today, the Great Depression is simply a painful memory for those who survived it, and perhaps a matter of historical interest. The Dow Jones Industrial Average makes the news every day, and the stocks rise and fall as usual. But as America begins its entry into the 21st century, could it be that it is once again on the verge of another Great Depression? This time one that would plummet the world's greatest power to the status of a poverty-stricken nation. Thousands of angry depositors mob Security Federal today as their doors closed for the last time. Security Federal is the 97th bank to collapse since last Thursday stock market crash. The FDIC has announced it will not be able to insure any of the accounts. 55,000 employees lost their jobs today as Microtech, one of the few remaining American-owned manufacturing companies, sold out to a Japanese firm. The Natasuki Corporation announced it would immediately relocate the production facilities to Mexico City. The announcement came as a shock to employees... Estimates of damages from Hurricane Franco, which swept through Florida's midsection last week, have reached a record high of $65 billion. For the first time in U.S. history, Government aid will not be available due to the severe economic The death crisis. toll has soared to over 600 as rioting continues to escalate in the nation's three largest cities. 
law enforcement agencies in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago have been unable to gain control, citing severe government cutbacks as the cause. I love this country, and it's with great pain I come to the reality. It's over. The America you and I grew up to understand in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s is a thing of the past. We face the possibility of a depression that could make the depression of 1929 look like a mild recession by comparison. Just think about it. Your job, your occupation, your industry, how much more dependent is it on every other job and industry in our economy right now? far more so than in 1929. We're going to have a collapse, meaning that it won't be a 10-year cycle like we had during the Great Depression. And understand that we aren't the same caliber nation uh, that we were during the Great Depression. If our government continues to spend more than it takes in, I predict with 100% certainty it will go broke. We have a government that is able to generate $1.2 trillion per year in taxes but it's taking 1.4 to 1.5 trillion dollars a year for them to live. And they're literally every year borrowing money just to make interest payments on the money they've already borrowed. Each year, the federal government spends more money than they raise in taxes. In 1992, the government had to borrow almost a quarter of all the money it spent. This amount that was borrowed is what is referred to as the deficit. Since the mid-60s, the government has been operating this way, and the grand total of all the deficits incurred over the years is called the national debt. By the end of 1992, the national debt was estimated at over $4 trillion. The government has given up trying to pay back the actual national debt and is struggling to keep up with just the interest payments. Experts project that within a few years, the interest payments alone on the national debt will absorb all the taxes collected. At this point, no money will be left to actually run the country, and America will be bankrupt. As we continue to increase the national debt each year, we will soon be paying more and more money in interest on that national debt. Uh, right now, interest is one of the top three expenditures in the national budget each year. And it will eventually, in a very few years, become the largest item in the budget. Uh, interest which is paid out and for which no governmental benefits are provided or services provided uh, to our citizens. If we could balance our budget, and I know that stretches the imagination, but if our budget was balanced, we're still in trouble because we don't have the cash flow to pay the interest on our existing debt, which means we borrow to pay the interest on the existing debt, which means that existing debt is compounding on its own right. Like a business or like an individual, if we continue to spend more than we're taking in, we're headed for what ultimately uh, could be economic collapse as far as the government's concerned. The United States was originally designed to operate on a pay-as-you-go basis. If it needed to spend more, it raised taxes or tariffs to generate the income. The only time the government borrowed to cover any substantial portion of its expenses was in time of war. All that changed in the 1960s. When John F. Kennedy was inaugurated as president, federal spending and federal revenues were less than $100 billion a year. The deficit was $3 billion a year. In November 1963, when President Kennedy was shot, our country took a turn that we failed to recognize. President Johnson declared war on poverty, war on Vietnam, and began borrowing money to achieve those goals at record rates. In the late 60s, we started the, the Great Society, where we were going to solve poverty in America through welfare funding. Once you got into that, and we found out that we couldn't solve it, we were into a program that we couldn't cure. And so America began to live on borrowed money, to a large degree funding our social programs, what we would now call entitlement programs. 
20 years later in 1981, federal spending had increased uh, to something in the $500 billion range. By the time uh, Ronald Reagan left office, federal spending was up above one trillion a year. And indeed, a federal debt, which was $914 billion in 1981, had grown to $2.8 trillion in 1989. In 1980, the percentage of the personal income tax needed to pay the interest on the debt was about 30%. But by 1992, 12 years later, that almost doubled to 60%. That's a little frightening because if we continue on that current course, some say by the end of this decade, it'll take all of the income from the personal income tax to pay the interest on the national debt. And then we're broke. Where will the money come from to pay the bills? By the end of the Bush presidency, the debt was $4.2 trillion, the acknowledged debt, not taking into account pension debts, student loan debts, unfunded liabilities uh, for Social Security. America owes $4 trillion. It must borrow $1,100,000,000 every day in order to keep up the pretense of the prosperity that we talk about today. And so for a number of years, it has been using up not simply its capital, that is all gone, but it has been using up its borrowing power. And when we come to the end of our borrowing power, when no one will put any of their value, like the Japanese, the Germans, the British, and others, into the American economy, then there must come to pass the coming breakpoint, and the coming breakpoint is upon us. It took 20 years for the government to officially examine the problem. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan appointed a special group of private businessmen to do an independent study on the trends in government spending. It was called the Foundation for the President's Private Sector Survey on Cost Control. It was headed by businessman J. Peter Grace and became more widely known as the Grace Commission. Mr. Grace put together a huge group of private businessmen, all privately funded, no government money involved, and they began to look at the government and how it operated and what they paid for things. They raised, as I recall, something like $74 million of private money, no government money was spent. They uh, in, uh, enlisted some 160 top executives to spend a year of their life on this thing, and they hired it with a budget they developed for themselves. They had about uh, 2,000 employees. And they did an analysis of the U.S. government and decided it was out of control, but they came up with, I believe, over 2,000 recommendations to somehow contain this monster. When I asked Peter Grace to take on the responsibility of running this commission, I had no idea the kind of energetic but healthy troublemaking I was contracting for. <laughs> With dedication and selflessness, you succeeded where others failed. You provided clear, concise, and practical recommendations to enormously complicated problems. The public now knows some hope and optimism that government can at last be made lean, cost-effective, and responsive to the people. That's why they're behind the Grace Commission's work, and that's why they're behind our plan for deficit reduction. The bottom line was they found something just under $500 billion worth of waste that could be trimmed out of the government on an annual basis without changing a single program. In other words, you didn't have to cancel welfare. You didn't have to cancel Medicare and Social Security. All you had to do is go in with standard business practices and trim out the waste, the overspending, the double billing, the bills that never got paid on time, those kinds of things. And unlike the people sitting in the middle of the federal government mess who see no problems, uh, they were able to see a lot of problems and project in the future what would happen if things weren't changed. They came to the conclusion that we didn't make some substantial change in the direction of this economy and some substantial reduction in the amount of deficits that we're running, that, it, that the government would reach a point where they could no longer fund themselves either through taxes or borrowing. At that time, uh, many people took it as alarmist and so forth, didn't take it seriously. But the shocking thing is now to go back and look at that report and see it track the projections they made for 85, 86, 87, 88, 89 are tracking within a few percent. And what it's predicting is a major, major collapse of this country. It was this startling information that prompted the co-chairman of the Grace Commission, Harry Figge Jr., to co-author a book to alert the nation's leaders, as well as the citizens at large, to make needed changes. 
it became a New York Times bestseller. One powerful graph in the book tracks the amount of borrowed money the government overspends each year. Although the levels fluctuate slightly from year to year within the various administrations, on the whole, the spending is increasing and will go off the chart within the next few years. Despite the inevitable consequences of this fiscal crisis, Congress continues to accelerate its irresponsible overspending, which further contributes to the national debt. The Graham-Rudman Act of 1985 made it mandatory for the government to live within its income and to balance the budget by 1991. The Grace Commission tracked the discrepancies between the estimated budgets and the actual spending. Despite the legal mandate, the amounts estimated and spent soared to new heights by 1991. According to the Grace Commission, Congress and the President have been using creative ways to get around the law. One loophole Congress uses is to regularly apply for temporary budget extensions. These extensions were originally designed only to be used in emergency cases. However, their use has now become common practice. Another deceptive practice Congress employs is to siphon the funds out of the Social Security Trust Fund. This allows them to reduce the annual deficit numbers presented to the public. We've been overpaying into the Social Security Fund now for the better part of uh, about six or seven years, and yet it doesn't have a dime in it. It's got a lot of numbers in it. But in truth, the government takes the money out, spends it in the general budget, so they don't have to show that as a deficit, and then substitutes an IOU in the form of zero coupon bond from the government. And since that's a called an internal transfer of government assets, in other words, the government says they own the trust fund. Therefore, when they transfer the money out of the trust fund into the general economy, they don't have to show that as a deficit. So it's lies. Another technique Congress uses to mask excess spending is to transfer budget overruns or excess spending into the next fiscal year. This creates the illusion of reduced spending without incurring the pain of actually making cuts. Another effective way the administration and Congress gets around the law is to shift many projects off budget. Examples of that is the post office. Post office government operation doesn't show up in the budget. It's, they found arguments to take it off budget. The Persian Gulf War. No reason for that not to be in the budget. It's not. They find reasons to take it off balance sheet. Many of the entitlements programs, those are the most scary, are also off balance sheet. And um, if you did this in business, you'd go to jail for fraud. The Grace Commission also found that when U.S. debt is compared to the growth of debt in other countries, it's higher and growing faster than all other industrialized nations in the world. Perhaps the most alarming information is presented in this graph, which depicts the dramatic rise in actual U.S. debt. The predictions since 1985 have incredibly been right on target. And if its tracking record remains accurate, in a few short years, the country will be bankrupt. Americans may get the false impression that the budget is being dealt with because it's talked about in nearly every newscast and election campaign. The truth is that very few have been bold enough to confront or even address the truth about the impending financial crash. In light of the accuracy of the Grace Commission's predictions, why didn't Congress fully support their recommendations? Because it was a Republican issue versus Democrats, and the Democrats controlled the, the House and the Senate by that time, most of the Grace Commission's recommendations never got implemented. Some of the recommendations that would save a lot of money uh, require a vote of Congress. And every bit of waste in the federal government has a champion somewhere in Congress who sees that not as waste, but as a gravy train. There are forces in this country that keep our entire society off balance with the huge budget uh, deficit that is paramount in this country today. While we hear senators and congressmen talk about wanting to solve the budget problem, I don't think they really want to in earnest. Now the members of Congress know about this spiraling national debt. They know all about it. They're oblivious to it. Some of them don't care. The majority don't care. All they're concentrating on is the next election. 20 years we've been fighting this battle over the budget, and somehow or another, 
out of all of the brains, out of all of the legal minds in this country, out of all of the people that are running around supposedly the brightest and the best in Washington, D.C., it cannot be solved? No, sir. But somebody doesn't want it solved. In my opinion, our government is not going to try to do it because the, the uh, cure is too tough for them to swallow politically. No one I've seen in the press or elsewhere deals with the problem quantitatively. They'll arm wave, they deal in platitudes. This is fraud and deceit. It's like an alcoholic who says, I'm gonna reduce my consumption. What he really means is, I wanna maintain the right to continue drinking. And that's precisely what our leaders in Washington are doing. They talk about reducing the deficit, but what it really gives them is nothing more than the opportunity to continue to borrow money and increase the debt. There's too much government, especially in Washington, and there's too much spending. We could cut out programs, we could cut back on programs, and people have got to quit just looking to the government to solve the problem. That's not the American way. Washington is irrevocably out of control. There are no controls, there's no responsibility, no one's held accountable for the decisions. And uh, to make the decisions to save this country, you, you guarantee you won't be reelected. So as a result, we are in deep trouble financially. The problem is an almost total disregard for any moral constraints in Washington. They don't feel any guilt about the fact that they spend more of our money than they raise. They don't feel any guilt about the fact that they don't account for our money properly. There are good people in Washington, to be sure. But most of them, like Warren Rudman of New Hampshire or Bill Armstrong of Colorado, have quit in disgust and left the place. And who does that leave running it? People who are willing to borrow and spend to purchase our votes. What do you do in that? U.S. government doesn't have the money to pay its bills. Um, there are experts have different theories. You could have a collapse of the government. That's what's happened in other countries. The scenario that most people uh, tend to presume will be hyperinflation. In other words, they'll print money to make the money, and that will cause uh, the, you know, the, the money supply to increase, which will cause more inflation. They will do what every government has done that's ever existed in history, and they will start to print money. They will inflate the economy so they can pay their bills. But for every dollar they pr print, my dollar goes down in terms of value. If they print two, mine goes down about 50 cents. They'll begin to print money as soon as we are not willing to pay any more in taxes. And they'll have to print money in order to pay their bills. The Germans after World War I did it. When they could no longer pay their bills and they couldn't raise the money through taxes, they had taxed the maximum and they were on the edge of revolt, they started printing money. Three years later, just three years later, the mark was worth 2.4 trillion marks per dollar. Money was worthless in Germany. It would take a basket full of money to go buy a loaf of bread, but you couldn't afford the basket, so it was irrelevant. Once you hyperinflate the dollar, it doesn't matter if you have a million dollars in the bank, it's worthless. Uh, Argentina was once one of the most uh, richest nations in the world, rivaling the United States uh, 50 years ago. Uh, but they went into hyperinflation and badly, badly damaged their economy. Within about a six-month period of time, the inflation rate in Argentina was at about 500% per year. Before they stopped the cycle, it was 5,000% per year. Well, when you have hyperinflation and the government prints a lot of money, two things happen. Uh, one, wages fall uh, because they're just, in real terms, they're not worth as much. But the most devastating thing is that savings and investment gets wiped out. Uh, if you had $100,000 in the bank and the government starts printing money, $100,000 could be worth $50,000 or $10,000 in no time at all. Whole families' plans for the future, pension uh, plans, insurance uh, plans. Uh, inflation can destroy uh, the wealth that has taken a, a generation or a lifetime to, to build up. And so this is where the middle class gets absolutely wiped right out. All of our savings, all of our bank accounts, all of our life insurance, all of that goes right down the tubes. As soon as investors see that America is not a good investment, jobs will fall like dominoes. Yours might not be the first to go, it might not be the second to go, but there's no question that sooner or later, you will be laid off. You will not be able to depend on your government to employ you. You will not be able to depend on any major uh, consortium like General Motors to continue to employ you. I think we're going to have massive defaults. 
with people losing their homes and losing their businesses and everything they've owned. In the hyperinflation scenario, it literally means a collapse of the economy as we know it. That generally leads to anarchy. We're going to have increased riots like we experienced in Los Angeles. I think that's just the beginning. You've got large segments of the population that are unemployed, out of work, probably not even employable in terms of literacy rates. And uh, so you've got the makings of major civil unrest. If they can't maintain law and order, when a verdict comes down that no one likes, how are they ever going to be able to maintain law and order when the actual government that's in charge of the currency has destroyed it? That which happened in Los Angeles is not apropos just to Los Angeles. All of the big cities across our country, the inner cities have the same tensions. They could erupt if they have reason to do so. One of the reasons would be if they don't have money to buy food to feed their families. There won't be a factory in America that's able to keep its accounts in order. How do you budget when you don't know the value of the currency with which you're budgeting? How do you make a payroll when you don't know the value of what you're paying out to your employees? There can only be one result, and that is shut down. Well, all that's going on. The local and state governments have an erosion of their tax base because of the, the uh, absence of profits in that sector and so on. So you'll have less budget for services. So the police and what have you will have less capability to deal with the growing unrest. You've got the makings for major civil disorder. In the past where this has happened, you have emerging out of that chaos, um, first of all, a deep quest for order. As people really begin to experience the anarchy, there will be a deep quest for order and they will tolerate emergency measures that they normally wouldn't. And this is what happened in Germany, which eventually planted the seeds for the rise of Hitler. Uh, in this country, who knows? But um, uh, all kinds of emergency measures will, of course, be empowered to try to deal with these things, and that will empower, in effect, a, a total loss of our personal freedoms. We're seeing ourselves set up for, for not just uh, a political and military global control, a dictatorship, if you will, but also absolute control financially, economically. Uh, we've seen this done in the Soviet Union, other, other communist nations, where when somebody doesn't play the game, he simply has his worker's card withdrawn, canceled. He can't do business. He can't get a job. He can't support his family. That's all it takes to make a man completely helpless. Projections could go on and on as to what life in America would be like after the fall. But perhaps the greatest psychological adjustment for the citizen to make will be to see America stepping down as a world power and at the mercy of foreign investors. The uh, economic peril that we're in right now is already eroding our leverage on the world scene. About 30% of our debt is foreign held, and already our policies are increasingly dictated by the holders of that debt. I take risk with other people's money. I have the ability to convert their dollars into any other foreign currency that I choose. It's a sad state on our economy when the American dollar is possibly the worst investment around. Who would want to own the American dollar and invest in a country whose government has shown year after year that it does not respect its own economy enough to balance its own budget? The alarm is sounding and the hour is late. Every responsible citizen who is willing to do whatever it takes to turn the tide and save our country for tomorrow and future generations wants to know what can be done. I think it takes a major change in attitude on the part of every American. Number one, to, get, to take this problem seriously, to hold their uh, elected representatives accountable, and to insist upon major changes, major changes. The time has come for a second American Revolution. I'm not talking about one with guns, but at the ballot box. I sincerely believe that if we Americans don't change who controls the Congress of the United States, we will have lost the opportunity to save this nation from national bankruptcy. We need to identify the big spenders in the Congress, whether Democrat or Republican, and give them the retirement they richly deserve. I think it's very important to make noise when you see a politician supporting spending legislation. There are a number of uh, taxpayer groups that rate members of Congress, 
and uh, you can get a hold of those ratings and look at whether somebody is uh, voting with the taxpayers or against them on a regular basis. Writing to members of Congress is not a fruitless exercise. It really does matter. People need to read. They need to educate themselves. And once they've educated themselves, they've got to get a hold of their congressman and wring his neck if necessary. Because the one thing that a congressman will respond to is an enraged populace. I believe there are some prudent things that everybody should be doing. The first thing is to get yourself out of debt, because whatever you owe for, given the wrong kind of an economy, potentially belongs to somebody else. So you can lose everything you have. And it doesn't matter how much you have, you can lose it. On a personal level, the wisest thing that any of us can do, irrespective of our station in life, is strive to the best that we can to get out of debt. Not easy to do in a consumer society, because the pressure to spend is everywhere around us. Lower your cost of living, use the difference to get out of debt. Then if you have a surplus, that gives you, first of all, some liquidity you can guard. In order to guard your liquidity, you have to know who the enemy is. And the number one enemy of your liquidity is the U.S. government. The Congress has to find ways to pay the interest bill. And the only cash it's got available is yours. I believe it's very prudent uh, for anybody to have some surplus of food on hand. I mean, uh, the fact that you can walk down to the local grocery store and buy food doesn't mean that local grocery store won't run out of food. We are going to have to create our own jobs, create our own wealth. There will be an entire new uh, industry, an underground economy possibly, springing up everywhere. Anyone who can do anything that is of value to anyone else will be able to survive. Anyone who's just dependent on some large corporation for a job to move some numbers around in accounting or do this, some technical skill is probably going to be out of work. This national indebtedness is really a national symptom of the attitudes that we Americans have come into personally, the personal attitudes we've come into about money, about property, about the lust after comfortable living being the, the driving force in American society for which we have to spend money to fund this kind of obsession. I know this is going to sound odd, but there's a sense in which this is not a fiscal problem, it's a spiritual problem. If a person can't stand to wait another day to get some material thing he wants, he's going to go in debt to get it. Our government has done it, and we've done it as individuals. There is a need for a spiritual revolution for the people of America to rediscover the Judeo-Christian roots on which the nation was founded. Because this runaway spending, this national debt, is, when you come down to it, is just a spiritual problem or a moral problem. Very simply, where do we who are living today get the moral authority to spend and consume and transfer to an unborn generation the duty of paying what we're consuming today? The reason that, that uh, the Bible, for example, emphatically rejects this kind of, of increasing debt as a lifestyle is that it creates, it fosters an attitude toward life that you can get something for nothing, that you don't have to be responsible. So the indebtedness is a symptom of a rejection of a responsible lifestyle, responsibility to God. It is part and parcel of our modern American rejection of a biblical way of life. When the American people abdicate their rights to their government, when they look to the government to solve the problem, when they don't address fundamental values, it begins in the home. It begins with the family and with the community. And we've gotten away from that. We've forgotten that God's blessed America and we've turned our backs on the kind of integrity he demands. There has been a moral inversion come to pass in America where the counterculture has become the culture, the establishment, and the established culture is now déclassé. It is, it is the counterculture. It has been deposed from the throne of, of moral, spiritual, political, epistemological control of the nation. As I look in the Bible, you don't see much reference to the United States in the last days. So we assume that we are either not dominant, or if so, we're merged into some other group. Biblically speaking, uh, I don't see the United States in Bible prophecy. Uh, I don't see a Western superpower either. Instead, I see a confederation of European nations 
and that would take the demise of the United States. The USSR has fallen apart in a shambles much faster than anyone would have predicted. Never would have dreamed it would have fallen apart that fast. America is also in the decline. The void that's left by these two declines is being filled by Europe on the one hand and Asia on the other. Japan is shifting its investment from the West to China. That makes all the sense in the world. Combine the Japanese capital and uh, technology with China's raw materials and labor, and you, you're going to spark the biggest economic revolution in recorded history. But the challenger to this will be Europe, not the U.S. And here in our lifetime, we're hearing about a one world currency. We hear about the new world order governmentally, and uh, the whole thing is being set, the scenario is being set. In the last analysis, when a culture goes, then the night comes when no man can work. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible does not promise some kind of instant economic recovery because of some spiritual formula, but the Bible says in the last days perilous time shall come. I believe that God is doing everything spiritually possible to awaken his people. And that if his people do not awaken, it's very possible that God will just turn his back and walk away from this nation and say, suffer whatever you have to suffer. Now, the best way to get the attention of God's people is persecution. We know that. During affluence, we have the tendency to forget about God. It is during difficulty that we come back to God. Instead of pointing the finger of blame or feeling hopeless, Christians should be the first to do everything possible to change the course of America's future. History has proven that people united in action can change a nation's destiny. But they also need to be prepared for the worst. The Bible confirms that the borrower will be the slave to the lender. Therefore, God's people must be committed to obtaining a debt-free lifestyle. In many cases, severe personal sacrifice will be necessary. Once their homes are in order, they should do everything possible to learn to make a living under adverse conditions and then share with others in need. As a body of Christ, our greatest asset is our numbers, and we ought to be working with each other to help each other. And that means start some plans, some programs within your local church. Take care of your own poor. Take care of the people that are out of work. Help them to get reemployed. Help them to buy gas for the car. Help them to keep their kids in school. Help them to be able to make the payments on their house, assuming that they're living by some kind of a, a reasonable budget. Those are the things that God calls us to do anyway. We don't have to wait for a crisis to do that. In fact, during a time of crisis, what we ought to do is draw together and literally become a family because that's what God says we are. And the local church ought to have a surplus of money and keep them from building a new building with it. Keep that surplus of money on hand to help the unemployed. You know, the, the command of Joshua to choose you this day who you will serve. That's going to be the call to the church of Jesus Christ. Who will we serve? Even when it's dark outside. And hey, uh, we've got to teach our people that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ before whom one day we will give an account. The beautiful effect is that man's importunity is God's opportunity. A guy that used to have a lot of money and all that it would buy who is now broke, it may just occur to him that it's time to pray to seek the Lord, and if he does that, then the equation is entirely different. Put God into the equation, anything is possible. Without him, in the last analysis, nothing really is that matters.